Good day, everyone. I am Mary Rose Caldero. My name is Avenue Grace Daria, and, and we are the reporters of Mahalata. For pre activity, you have to analyze and arrange the scramble letters to form a word. First, it is an ancient Indian epic where the main story revolves around two branches of the family, the Pandavas and Kalavas, who, in the Kurukshetra War, battle for the throne of Hastinapura. Second, it is the world's oldest religion according to many scholars with roots and customs dating back more than 4,000 years. In addition, it is the third largest religion behind Christianity and Islam. Third, the specific role and responsibilities a person is fated to have, exclusive to that person and specific to his caste. It can only be satisfied through action. Fourth, a type of flower that represents beauty and growth in Hinduism. Fifth, it is the Hindu class system determined by birth. Hello everyone! Today, I'm gonna tell you the story behind Mahabharata. Long ago, the kingdom of Asinapur was ruled by a mighty king called Satan. He was an efficient ruler. One day, he was traveling in the countryside. He met a beautiful girl named Ganga, the goddess of river. The king asked God to marry him. Ganga was ready to marry him if he made her a promise that he should never question about the reason for her actions. The king said yes. He married Ganga and made her his queen. Ganga gave birth to seven kids, but immediately after delivery, all kids were let in the river. King Santana became deeply depressed because of the actions of Ganga but he refrained from questioning her. The eighth kid was born, and Santana could not control himself any longer. He questioned Ganga for her actions that broke his promise. Ganga gave the eighth child to King Santana and left him over. Santana was in deep sorrow, unable to bear the separation of his wife. He named his son Divavrata. Several years later, when Divavrata had grown up to be an accomplished prince, Santana fell in love with Satyabati. Her father refused to let her marry the king unless the king promised that Satyabati's son and his tenants would inherit the throne. Unwilling to deny Divavrata's rights, Santana declined to do so, but the prince, on coming to know the matter, rode over to Satyabati's house, vowed to renounce the throne and to remain celibate throughout his life. The prince then took Satyabati home to the palace so that the king, his father, could marry her. On account of the terrible vow that he'd taken that day, the Vavrat came to be known as Bhishma. King Santanu was so pleased with his son that he granted to the Vavrat the boon of choosing the time of his death. Years passed, Satyavati gave birth to two sons namely Vichitavarya and Shetramada. After a few years, King Santanu passed away. Satyavati's sons are still minors. The affairs of the kingdom were managed by Bhishma and Satyavati. By the time the sons reached adulthood, Shetramada had died in a skirmish with some Gedharvas, or heavenly beings. So, the younger son, Vishitavarya, was enthroned. Bhishma decided to give three beautiful princesses, namely Amba, Ambika, and Ambalika, for his brother. He abducted the three princesses of a neighboring kingdom. 
He fought with the other kings and brought him over to Hastinapur to be wedded to Vichitavarya. On the way, Amba pleaded to Bhishma to spare her. She declared that she was in love with someone else, so she had let go. When Bhishma reached to Hastinapur, Amba came back to him. My lord, the prince who was supposed to marry me abandoned me since he was defeated by you. Please help me out in this. I don't know what to do, said Amba. Amba, I am helpless. It was your decision to go back, said Bhishma. My lord, it was you who, de who defeated the other princess and brought me into place. Can you marry me and take me with you? Young lady, I have already vowed that I will never marry in my lifetime. I cannot break the vow. I'm sorry that I'm not able to help you, said Vishnu. You have wrecked my life. Where do I go now? Who will marry me? I take this vow that one day I will cause your death, said Amma. Amba moved away from the palace, while Bhishma was annoyed by Amba's words. Meanwhile, the other two princesses were married to Vishitavarya, who died soon afterwards, childless. So that the family line did not die out, Satyavadi summoned her son Vyasa to impregnate the two queens. Yasa had been born to Satyapati of a great sage named Parashara before her marriage to Shantan. Thus, by a new custom, the two queens each had a son of Yasa. To the elder queen was born a child's son called Dretarashta, and to the younger was born an otherwise healthy but extremely pale son called Pandu. The maid of these queens was a born son of Yasa called Vidur. Bhishma brought up these three boys with great care. Dhritarashtra grew up to be the strongest of all princes in the country. Pandu was extremely skilled in warfare and archery. And Vidur knew all the branches of learning, politics, and statesmanship. With the boys grown, it was now time to fill up the empty throne of Hastinapur. Dhritarashtra, the eldest, was bypassed because the laws barred a disabled person from being king. Pandu, instead, was crowned. Bhishim negotiated with Dhritarashtra's marriage of Pandu and Dhritarashtra. Dhritarashtra's wife was Gandhari as her god's husband was blind. She decided not to see the world. Meanwhile, Bhishma approached his friend to marry Kunti to Pandu. His friend gladly accepted the proposal. Before Kunti went back to kingdom, she came to the riverbed and was constantly thinking about the Guru's boom. She thrice Dimanta, she opened her eyes and saw the powerful sun. She decided to call on the sun god. She closed her eyes and spelled the mantra. Just then, with a thousand blazing, blazing rails, the sun god appeared. Kunti trembled with fear. She wanted to take back the mantra because she was an unmarried girl and asking for forgiveness towards him. The sun god explained that he cannot go back without giving her the child. Kunti was spellbound. The next moment, a lovely child was in the hands of Kunti and the son of God disappeared. Kunti was stunned to see the glowing child with an armor in the chest and two lovely earrings. The child looked divine. Kunti wasn't able to take her eyes off the child. She immediately, immediately took a box, placed the child, and sent it down the river. Mom knew about this except her. That child was Karna, the son of God. On the next day, 
Pandu married to Kunti and Madri, with things running smoothly in the country and with its coffers full. Pandu asked his elder brother to look after the state affairs and retired to the forest with his two wives for some time off. One day, Pandu went to hunting in the forest. He saw a male and a female gazelle. He shoots the male gazelle, and the female cursed him that if Pandu make love to either of his two wives, he will instantly die. Pandu was terribly disturbed and informed the matter to his two wives. Kunti said, Please do not worry about it. God will always show us way. Pandu replied, If I don't have kids, our generation will come to an end. And what will he do now? My lord, I have to tell you about the boon. Kunti told Pandu about the boon. After that, Kunti chanted the mantra. She prayed to Lord Yama and got a son. They named him Yudhisthira. The second time, Kunti called upon Lord Vayu, the wind of God. The kid was named Bhima. The third time, Kunti called upon Lord Indra. The son whom she got was named as Arjuna. Pandu was pleased with all the children. Kunti called taught the mantra to Madri. Madri recited the mantra and called upon the ash winds. She had two sons, namely Nakula and Shahadiva. The first son, Yudhisthira, stood for righteousness and truth as he was the son of Yama, the god of death and justice. The second son, Bhima, stood for strength and power as he was the son of Vayu, the wind of God. The third son, Arjuna, stood for heroism, competency, and courage, as he was the son of Lord Indra. The fourth and fifth sons were Nakula and Sahadiva. They stood for wisdom and endurance, as they were the sons of the Ashwins. The kids grew up as royal princes. A few days passed, King Harry delivered, but to everyone's surprise, it was not a baby. It was a ball of flesh. King Harry was in tears. Just then, Sage Vyasa came to meet Dhritarashtra. Sage Vyasa, please help us. King Harry wasn't able to bear this. As it is, we were unhappy that we did not have a child. And now, this, please bless me that my son should rule the Hastinapur. Dhritarashtra, this is a curse. Cut the ball of flesh into a hundred pieces and put them in a jars of ghee. What will happen? said Dretarashtra. Do as I say and wait until tomorrow. Dretarashtra acted according to the instructions of Sage Vyasa. The next morning, somehow, the sun did not rise with in its unusual time. The skies were dark. The wolves howled and the owls screamed, and a numerous silence surrounded the palace of Hastinapur. The guards came running to Dhritarashtra. My lord, a great news! There are children in all 101 jars! It's really exciting to see the children. They're crying for food. We don't know how to take care of them. Ken Harry was extremely happy too. Just then, Sage Vyasa entered the palace. Great Sage, I can never forget you. You're like a god to this kingdom. If you had not been here, the entire Kura dynasty would have been doomed. Kretarashtra, I have something to tell you. Of all the children, the first child in the first jar is your first son. I have decided to name him Doryodhana. Your first son will not bring good to this kingdom. He might even destroy your dynasty. Oh God, what are you talking about? said King Harry. Great sage, what is this that you're saying at this suspicious moment? said the king. It is better that you send him away after a few years to a distant place. No, 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 not at all. I cannot spare my son, said King Harry. 
Sage, will you stop all this? He is my son and my eldest son. He will rule this kingdom and will teach a lesson to all the people who oppose him. He will be the most powerful ruler of all times, said the king. The sage left with a heavy heart. A few years later, Kunta returned to Hastinapur. With her were five little boys and the bodies of Pandu and Madri. The Kuru elders performed the last rites for Pandu and Madri, and Kunti and the children were welcomed into the place. All of the 105 princesses were subsequently entrusted to the care of a teacher, Kripa at first, and additionally, Rona later. Drona school at Sinopore attracted several other boys. Karna of the Suti clan was one such boy. It was here that hostilities quickly developed between the sons of Dhritarashtra, collectively called the Kauravas, patronymic of their ancestors Kauru, and the sons of Pandu, who are collectively called the Pandavas, patronymic of their father. Years passed. One day, when Drona trained the princess, he wanted to test them. Dear students, I have taught you all the nuances of ar archery. Well, I hope you don't have any doubts, said Drona. Guru, you give me any target. I will strike it straight, said Guru. Not you. Even I can do that, mine it? Dorya Donna exclaimed. All right, in this skill, concentra concentration is very important. I want to test your concentration. Are you ready? Guru, tell us what to do, said Bhima. Look at the bird on the top of the tree. Now, I want you to strike the bird. Yes, Guru, that's simple, huh, said Dory Donna. I will do it, Guru, said Bhima. Okay, Bima, come here. Bima, what do you see now? Guru, I see the bird, the tree, trunk, and leaves. All right, you move aside. Now, Doryodana, come here. Tell me what you see now. The bird, its feathers, the trees, clouds, and flowers, said Doryodana. Oh, Arjuna, come here. Tell me what do you see, said Guru. Guru, I see the eye of the bird. What else do you see? Guru, I am able to see only the eye of the bird and nothing else. Excellent! Now shoot the bird. Good shot! This is what I expected when you concentrate on something. Nothing else should be visible to you, even if it is before your eyes. The princess got trained well in all the arts. They completed their education, but the hatred between the Pandavas and Kauravas grew day by day. Doryodhana hated Bhima to the core, and he was jealous of Arjuna. Yudhishtra hated Doryodhana's crude ways. There was a time when Doryodhana tried and failed to poison Bhima, the second Pandava. Karna! Because of his rivalry in archery with the bird Pandava, Arjuna allied himself with Doryodhana. In time, the princess learned all the good from their teachers. One day, Kuru elders decided to hold a public skills exhibition of the princess. It was during this exhibition that the citizens became plainly aware of the hostilities between the two branches of royal family. Doridana and Bhima had the maze fight that had to be stopped before kings turned ugly. Karna, uninvited as he was not a poor prince, challenged Arjuna, was insulted on account of his non-royal word. Arjuna, I have proved that I do can do whatever you can do. So what? We don't encourage anyone who comes here and not to invite it, said Arjuna. This is an open competition and not only for you. 
but I'm ready to challenge you. Can you face me? said Arjuna. Who are you? How dare you come here and argue with me? Are you a king? Do you have a kingdom? Speak up! Who are you? Karni bowed his head down. Just then, Doryutana got up from the sea. Arjuna, Karna is my brother from today. I gave a part of my kingdom to him. He is a king and is now equal to you. Face him if you have the gods. The Pandavas walked out. After that, Karna was crowned the king of a Vesa state on the spot by Doryutana. It was also around this time that questions began to be raised about Dhritarashtra occupying the throne, since he was supposed to be holding it only in trust for Pandu, the crown king. To keep peace in the realm, Dhritarashtra declared the eldest Pandava, Yudhishthira, as the crown prince and higher authority. To continue, Yudhishthira being the crown prince and his rising popularity with the citizens was extremely disastrous to Duryodhana, who saw himself as the rightful heir since his father was the de facto king. He plotted to get rid of the Pandavas. This he did by getting his father to send the Pandavas and Kunti off to a nearby town on the pretext of a fair that was held there. The palace in which the Pandavas were to stay in the town was built by an agent of Duridana. The palace was made of entirely inflammable materials since the plan was to burn down the palace together with the Pandavas and Kunti once they settled in. The Pandavas, however, were alerted to this fact by their uncle Vidura and had counter plan ready. They dug an escape tunnel underneath their chambers. One night, the Pandavas gave out a huge feast which all of the townsfolk came to. At that feast, a forest woman and her five sons found themselves so well fed and well drunk and they could no longer walk straight. They passed out on the floor of the hall. That very night, the Pandavas themselves set fire to the palace and escaped through the tunnel. When the flames had died down, the townsfolk discovered the bones of the forest woman and her boys and mistook them for Kunti and the Pandavas. Duryodhana thought his plan had succeeded and that the world was free of the Pandavas. Meanwhile, the Pandavas and Kunti went into hiding, moving from one place to another and passing themselves off as a poor Brahmin family. They would seek shelter with some villager for a few weeks. The princess would go out daily to beg for food, return in the evenings and had over the day's earnings to Kunti, who would divide the food into two. One half was for the strongman Bhima and the other half was shared by the others. During these wanderings, Bhima killed two demons, married the demoness, and had a demon child called Gatatacha. They then heard about a swayamvar or a ceremony to choose a suitor being organized for the princess of Panchal and went at Panchal to see the festivities. The brothers sat themselves down in the hall to watch the fun. The princess Draupadi was famed for her beauty and every prince from every country for miles around had come to the swine bar hoping to win her hand. The conditions of the swine bar were difficult a long pole on the ground has a circular contraption spinning at the stop. From on this moving disc was attached a fish. At the bottom of the pole was a shallow urn of water. A person had to look down into this water mirror, use the bow and five arrows that were provided, and pierce the fish spinning on top. Five attempts were allowed. 
it was an evident that only an extremely skilled archer, such as the now presumed dead Arjuna, could pass the test. One by one, the kings and princes tried to shoot the fish and failed. Some could not even lift the bow, some could not string it. The Kauravas and Karna were also present. Karna picked up the bow and strung it in a moment, but was prevented from taking aim when Draupadi declared she would not marry anyone from the Sutta clan. After every one of the royals had failed, Arjuna, the third Pandava, stepped up to the pole, picked up the bow, strung it, affixed all the five arrows to it, looked down into the water, aimed, shot, and pierced the fish eye with all of the five arrows in a single attempt. Arjuna had won Jopadi's hand. The Pandava brothers, still in disguise of poor Brahmins, took Draupadi back to the hut they were staying at and shouted for Kunti. Ma! Ma! Come and see what we brought back today. Kunti saying, whatever it is, share it among yourselves. She came out of the hut, saw that it was an arms but the most beautiful woman she had ever set her eyes on and stood stock still as the import of her words sank in on everybody present. To keep Kunti's words, it was decided that Lopadi would be the common wife to all the five Pandavas. The Pandavas had entered into an agreement among themselves regarding Draupadi. She was to be wife of each Pandava by turn for a year. Meanwhile, the prosperity of Intraprasta and the power of the Pandavas was not something that Doryadana liked. He invited Yudhishthira to a dice game and got his uncle Shakuni to play on his behalf. Shakuni was an accomplished player. Yudhishthira stayed and lost step by step and time well his kingdom, his brothers, himself, and Draupadi. Draupadi was dragged into the dice hall and insulted. There was an attempt to disrobe her, and Bhima lost his temper and vowed to kill each and every one of the Kauravas. Tor you Dana! I will tear your tides and drink your blood! This is my vow, said Bhima. You heartless devil, I will smear my hair with your blood. Until then, I will not dye my hair. This is the greatest vow of my life, said Draupadi. Things came to such a boil that Dhritarashtra intervened unwillingly, gave the kingdom and their freedom back to the Pandavas and Draupadi and set them off back to Indraprastha. Great uncle, I will never forget this great dishonor. No woman on earth should suffer like me for the way you people have treated me. They will be punished terribly. Your dynasty will perish said Draupadi. Draupadi, get up. Calm yourself. Don't talk big words. Toritana, give them some property, said the king Dhritarashtra. This under Doridana put up his father around and invited Yudhishthira to another dice game. This time, the condition was the loser would go on on a 12-year exile followed by a year of life incognito. If they were be discovered during this incognito period, 
the loser would have to repeat the 12 plus 1 cycle. The dice game was played. British Tara lost again. Duridana gave some land and sent them away. Everyone present the hall are in great grief to see the Pandavas humiliated. They had to come as kings and were now seen as slaves. For this exile, the Pandavas left their aging mother Kunti behind at Hastinapur in Vidura's place. They live in forest, hunted game, and visited holy spots. At around this time, Yudhishthira asked Arjuna to go to the heavens in quest of celestial weapons because by now, it was apparent that their kingdom would not be returned to them peacefully after the exile and that they would have to fight for it. Brother, please permit me to move from here. I wanted to go and meditate on Lord Shiva and get some powerful weapons. Without weapons, we cannot face our enemies. After our exile period, we need weapons to face the Karabas. As you please, Arjuna, I wish you get the blessings of Lord Shiva early and return back with powerful weapons, said Yudhishthira. Arjuna did so, and not only did he learn the techniques of several divine weapons from the gods, he also learned how to sing and dance from the Gandavas. After 12 years, the Pandavas went incognito for a year. During this one-year period, they lived in the Virat Kingdom. Yudhishthira took up employment as the king's counselor. Bhima worked in the royal kitchens. Arjuna turned himself into an eunuch and taught the palace maidens how to sing and dance. The queens worked at the royal stables and Dropadi became a handmaiden to the queen. At the end of the incognito period, during which they were not discovered despite Duryodhana's best efforts, the Pandavas revealed themselves. The Virata king was overwhelmed. He offered his daughter in marriage to Arjuna, but he declined since he had been her dance teacher the past year and students were akin to children. Arjuna, I have small request, said the king. Please, tell me. You have taught my daughter Utarai music and dance. I request you to take her as your wife. Arjuna smiled. I am old enough to be her father, but as I cannot turn down your request, I can wed her to my son and take her as my daughter-in-law. The princess was married instead to Arjuna's son Abhimanyu. At this wedding ceremony, a large number of Pandava allies gathered to draw out a war strategy. Meanwhile, emissaries had been sent to Hastinapur to demand Indraprastha back but the missions had failed. Krishna himself went on a peace mission and failed. Duridana refused to give away as much land as was covered by the point of a needle, let alone the five villages proposed by the peace missions. Duryodhana refuses to give his cousins back their kingdom because he claims they came out of hiding before the appointed time. Duryodhana was unwilling to restore the Pandavas to their half of the kingdom when the 13 years had expired. Both sides then called upon their many allies and the two large armies arrayed themselves on Kuru's field. The Kauravas had 11 divisions to stand against the 7 of the Pandavas. 
The two armies are described as two oceans, crashing against each other. Just before the war bubble resounded, Arjuna saw Ari before him his relatives. His great grandfather Bhishma, who had practically brought him up, his teachers Kripandana, his brothers the Parabas, and for a moment, his resolution wavered. Krishna, the warrior par excellence, had given up arms for this war and had elected to be Arjuna's charioteer. Krishna offers Arjuna first choice. Either he can all have the Krishna's armies or he can have Krishna alone. Arjuna chooses Krishna, allowing Duridana to have armies. When Arjuna asks him to drive his chariot, Krishna accepts. On the first day of the battle, Bhishma leads the Karabas army to enter the battle and he wins the war. Many were killed in the Pandava by the end of the first day. The second day of the battle, the Karaba army had suffered great losses at the end of the second day. On the third day, Bhishma arranged Karaba forces in the formation of an eagle, while well, the Pandavas countered this by using the present formation. On this day, Gatakacha, the son of Bhima, entered the battlefield. He threw the soldiers in all possible directions. Also, Arjuna's son Iravan was killed in battle. The next day, Arjuna said, Take me back, Krishna. I can kill these people. They are my father, my brothers, my teachers, my uncles. My sons, what good is a kingdom that's gained at the cost of their lives? Then followed a philosophical discourse that has today become a separate book on its own. The Bhagavad Gita. Krishna explained the impermanence of life to Arjuna and the importance of doing one's duty, of sticking to the right path. Krishna then reveals his divine, universal nature to Arjuna in a magnificent vision of a multitude of gods stretching out to infinity. Krishna tells him as a warrior and it's his dharma to fight. The real conflict today is with the self on the battlefield of the soul. If you proceed to war treating equally joy and sorrow, gain and loss, victory and defeat you do not see. You have right only to work, you have no claim to the fruits thereof. Do not let unexpected result dictate your actions. Do not sit idle either. Krishna called Shikandi, the you know who has taken birth to kill Bhishma. Shikandi had been granted the boon of killing Bhishma by Brahma itself. Shikandi was no longer than Amba. Krishna knew well that Bhishma would not find a female or Yumyo. Shikandi's arrows pierced the body of Bhishma. Bhishma is now lying in the bed of arrows. The next day, Abhimanyu, the son of Arjuna, fought bravely at the battle. Later, he was killed by the Korobos because Hayadrata tries to fight with Arjuna and he could not help his son. Drona takes the command instead, but later Drupada's son Rishtadayumna cuts off 
Drona's head, having sworn to avenge his father's humiliation. Meanwhile, Duridana asked Karna to avenge his brother Dusasana, and he finally meets Arjuna in the decisive confrontation. As he struggles to release his chariot, he cries out to Arjuna, but Krishna commands Arjuna to shoot and Karna dies. Also, Bhima kills most of the 100 Kauravas who were demons incarnate. Bhima wins only by treacherously striking Duryodhana on the legs. Duryodhana died. The battle raged for 18 days. Casualties on both sides were high. When it all ended, the Pandavas had won the war but lost almost everyone they held dear. Duryodhana and all the Kauravas had died. And had all the menfolk of Draupadi's family, including all of her sons by the Pandavas. In 18 days, the entire country lost almost three generations of its men. It was a war not seen on scale before. It was the Great Indian War, the Mahabharata. After the war, Yudhishthira became king of Hastinapur and Indaprastha. The Pandavas ruled for 36 years, which they abdicated in favor on Abhimanyu's son, Parikshit. The Pandavas and Draupadi proceeded on the foot to the Himalayas, intending to live out their last days, climbing the slopes heavenwards. One by one, they fell on this last journey, and their spirits ascended to the heavens. Years later, Parikshit's son succeeded his father as a king. He held a big sacrifice at which this entire story was recited for the first time in a disciple of Vyasa called Vaishampai. That's all. Hope you like this story. For the comprehensive questions, number one, you are going to explain the family tree of Guru dynasty of Hastinapur, the Pandavas and Kauravas. Number two, how did the hostilities between Pandavas and Kauravas started? Number three, what can we learn from Mahabharata? For evaluation, it is a multiple choice type of quiz wherein you have to choose the letter of the best answer. So I will give you 10 minutes to answer these questions and after that you have to submit it 